With that, I'm going to just uh, pull up my notes and introduce our current speaker who you see reflected on our screen. Um, just give me one second. Um, in the interim, as you probably heard belabored throughout the course of this summit, uh, we just asked folks to please um, enter any questions or any comments by way of the Q&A feature or through the chat. Also, you'll recognize that you have been muted and will be for the duration of the session up until the Q&A portion where I can also take you off mute if you'd like to pose your question uh, directly by way of orally. Um, also, there's a closed caption function that can be activated should you require um, any type of accommodation to participate or listen in on the audio transcript. And, and first and foremost, we just ask that you refrain from any use of any profane language and keep all comments and chat on topic as much as possible to not distract or take away from the experience of your colleagues in the call. Um, I should have, you know, prefaced all of this by introducing myself. My name is Delaney Hines. Um, I serve as the uh, co-chair co for this year's uh, 2023 Sickle Cell Disease Summit. I'm also a member of the board of directors for SCAGO and I chair the Education Committee. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to transition now to introducing our speaker online, Dr. Sandra Newton. Uh, she's an experienced clinician with training in developmental, clinical, and school psychology. She carries an MA and PhD from the University of Toronto. She is also a long-standing um, interester in, or she has a long-standing interest, sorry, in advocacy, education, and support for children, youth, and adults with sickle cell disease. At SCAGO, Dr. Newton facilitates workshops and peer support group sessions to support research initiatives such as the vaccination acceptance within the sickle cell disease slash Black community, um, all, uh, all supported by the Public Health Agency of Canada, and she also provides supportive counseling to clients. So, we really appreciate you taking this time this Saturday afternoon to spend it with us, Dr. Newton, and I hand things over to you. Take it away. Well, thank you so much, Delaney. This is, uh, it's wonderful to be here, and I just thank everyone for their patience with us as we transition to this session, which I believe is one of the final ones of the summit, so no pressure at all, right? Um, but I actually do hope that um, you'll find in this what I hope can be a discussion, although that we are webinar style. Um, um, just, you know, touching on what we know, what we still need to know around the whole matter of relationships within sickle cell disease. And I certainly don't come to this um, presuming to understand the intricacies of individual relationships of those that may be joining us today or those who are not here. Um, much more to speak about what we know from those who have been able to try to study these patterns and see what we can glean from that. Um, spoiler alert is that there's much more that needs to be studied about the particulars of relationships um, of a romantic nature in sickle cell disease, but I'll get to that. And uh, some of the things that we can do, whether we are part of that, that couple or that relationship dyad uh, to support um, positive and uh, sustained relationships. So I'm really looking forward to um, sharing what uh, I have with you. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, thank you um, for the orientation already provided by Delaney around questions and answers. Um, you'll have a chance to meet um, my uh, partner in this presentation, um, Daniela, um, and she joins us toward the end. She's going to be our moderator and ask me some questions about um, themes arising. So let's get to it. Um, Really just do okay. I think we're here. Wonderful. So I thought it would be helpful to approach this just as is anyone wanting to learn more about a, a topic of concern of interest and thinking about an approach. And so, you know, being somebody who works clinically, my first thought was to look at what's been published, to look at, um, you know, what is out there in terms of research studies, knowing that that is often our source of information about what works for whom. But I know very well, um, just having had the privilege of being part of our peer support and other psychosocial services here at Skago and outside of here, that um, we need to value life experience and lived experience um, highly. Um, even though those are, are sometimes discounted as anecdotal accounts, that's where the richness is and that's where the real life is. So I hope in my um, sharing today, 
but you'll also be reflecting perhaps on your own experience or those of people you know, and weighing that with the sort of, um, you know, weight that we would give to any other source of information. I mentioned here that I would love to hear from our audience if that, there's an opportunity to do that um, through our Q&A and, and other communication chat channels during this talk. I'd like to make sure that this is not just about the difficulties that may be inherent uh, in uh, romantic relationships, intimate partnerships, um, but also the opportunities and not just within that pairing but or that couple or that relationship, but also everything surrounding it, whether medically, whether socially, um, through the family, what have you. I'd always like, just in keeping with our advocacy theme, to think about the things that support um, relationship success. And, you know, that's as people define it within that relationship, of course. Um, but just wanting to think about that and, and what we can do as those um, supporting um, partners uh, to have um, a healthy and enduring relationship. Uh, I will mention some resources and then, of course, want to get to any questions that come up. So with that... Let me share the next slide with you for the resume. Great. I think it goes without saying that romantic relationships are just one type of relationship of significance in the lives of individuals with sickle cell disease, right? We are children. We are um, parents or caregivers sometimes. Um, in our families, we have multiple generations represented, including extended family. We also have relationships outside of our families of origin, right? We have our employers, we have our, our teachers, we have colleagues in the workplace and elsewhere. And of course we have our friendships and that may not even be the comprehensive list. Um, relationships you know, are part of our fabric and we're highlighting just one kind today. I think it also goes without saying that relationship quality is going to be sensitive to stressors that are operating on the people involved. And that may be within that person, you know, their, their mental health, their physical health. It can also be um, to do with things environmentally or societally that are having an impact on the functioning of that relationship. So I just want to um, encourage that broadness of um, lens and understand that we are tunneling down into one kind of relationship of significance here. When we think about what we know, we know that relationship quality, and again, quality being, you know, there are a few definitions out there, but thinking about that as something that helps derive satisfaction on the part of those that are part of the relationship. This is a general finding um, across many types of studies involving thousands and thousands of participants, some of whom may or may not have had sickle cell disease, although that wasn't a focus. But here's what we know, right? Let's start with that. Um, the quality of relationship, it seems, is predicted by a number of key factors. Um, perceived partner commitment, so feeling like that bond is solid and that that other person is, is in it for the duration. Um, so security may be another way of uh, framing that. Appreciation of partner, how that is felt and how that is conveyed. Satisfaction with intimacy levels within the relationship. Thinking about how satisfied the partner is, right? that can sometimes be a preoccupying factor for one of the individuals in the um, pairing or the relationship. And importantly, um, conflict um, being minimized, right? More harmony, cooperation, cohesion. These are the things that seem to um, support relationship quality in a general sense. But it's helpful to think, well, how might that look um, in the case of chronic illness and then also physical uh, cell disease? So moving in that direction, if we go from the overarching, you know, what supports relationship quality, what's the impact of something like a chronic illness? And of course, sickle cell disease is present in a person's life from birth um, and um, is carried through their life course. It is chronic in nature. It's ongoing, right? And even though there are treatments that can improve it in certain ways, and, and you know, in some cases there are curative measures, although those aren't widely available to everyone. Um, it's, it's something that is in the atmosphere and in your life for life. But what we know, again, from general studies of other types of chronic illnesses, and I believe that um, uh, arthritis, uh, diabetes, um, other types of congenital or conditions present at birth are better studied uh, as pertains to partnership, stress and impact than sickle cell diseases at the moment. But we do know that roles shift when chronic illness is part of the picture. 
right? Even if folks come from a traditional background, and I put that in quotes, where there are, say, male roles and female roles, um, and I know that there's certainly a variation in, in genderedness of partners, um, but traditional um, points of uh, view about who does what necessarily shift frequently within a chronic illness um, context, simply because of the impact of the condition and what it's demanding from the individuals involved, not just the affected person, but those around them. It does change intimacy patterns, right? And um, one sense of well-being, one sense of themselves and their, you know, um, willingness to participate in intimate acts, uh, their self-perception of themselves physically, that is all interrupted for many. Um, with chronic illness. Stress in the family is increased because of the, um, you know, the course of the illness for that person. Of course, it matters how well that condition is, quote, managed, right? How stable it is, how well supported that person is in terms of their health care and well-being. But there can be an impact on the family and therefore on the individuals that are part of the family. Um, contributing to some um, Shifts in long-term goals together. People are coming together often because they have shared futures in mind. But those goals and what they look like, um, those endpoints may shift necessarily as the disease changes or as the people involved change and their adaptation to it. Um, very important for us to think about in the sickle cell context. I think the bit that gets quite enough um, attention is the impact on the partner, right? and the potential for partner burnout. Um, not a word anybody likes to hear, but just you know, understanding the toll that caregiving stress may take, especially where there is a partner who is taking on those caregiving pieces and thinking about the well-being of that person and how that partner's well-being also folds back into the relationship proper. So I thought I would just put a little sort of visual together that suggests that, yes, on the left, we do want to think about the relationship of the people involved directly, right? We want to think about, you know, the person with the diagnosis and their partner and what's going on with them. And we want to think about the unit that they create together and how that is functioning. Then we want to think about the interaction with that, potentially with other things that are not maybe right inside of the individual or couple, but having an influence. Um, certainly sickle cell and the course of sickle cell and how that person's managing, that's influencing how the couple is doing, depending on, of course, the resilience and supports built in more or less. Um, indirect factors, what about, you know, something like COVID or shifts in the economy and, you know, bigger and smaller factors that are going to affect any family that may have particular ways of engaging when you are um, a couple coping with sickle cell disease. And I want to leave room for other contributory factors. Again, this is not something that's been, you know, established um, by research. I hope that we will have the study or studies like that sometime soon. But we want to be able to just allow that at least these, these worlds are meeting and uh, they're important to think about not just from the perspective of the person uh, dealing with sickle cell disease, but those that would hope to help them provide support to them. Thinking about relationship quality and sickle cell then. So we've gone sort of from that overarching piece to then thinking about the chronic illness context and now thinking about some of those other factors. What might be indirect, right? What are some things that may also be functioning on a couple in relationship? Well, stigma, right? Um, that's that public perception, negative perception or judgment about the sickle cell and a lot of misinformation about what is involved. Some still don't know, for example, that it is an inherited and not a communicable condition. It's something that people are born with. You can't give it or catch it um, in those, you know, sort of common senses of the word. But people don't have a lot of information about it and then they have fears or concerns around that. Um, the parent and family expectations. I'll share something shortly, but, you know, even as you're growing up and coming to understand yourself, you're being given messages a lot about, you know, the kind of future you might have um, as a person with sickle cell disease. And, you know, your potential to have a family and be in a relationship. What does that mean for what someone brings to bear in their own relationship? I've spoken about the gender roles previously, but, you know, faith traditions as well, um, you know, all of these things are operating uh, on people um, given, at given points. I mentioned sickle cell disease knowledge because I do think, again, the more that you have good information, the more you understand what is happening to the best of your ability, the more that you can deal with um, 
you know, some of the fear, some of the, the worry that arises from not really understanding what is going on and perhaps buying into things that, you know, are not um, substantiated and would get in the way of good relationship quality. Um, I think that's in just tied to the knowledge part is, you know, how much has that person grown up learning about sickle cell itself and how it manifests for them? And, you know, have they gone through discussions about counseling and family planning, if those been parts of their, you know, have they had access to that? Meaning, you know, are they thinking about that as they go forward in their lives from an early age? And it can't be underscored in that final point, just about the social support network is so important. Having that net, that safety net, no matter what one is going through, is usually associated with better outcomes. So these are not necessarily factors within the couple, but what they are able to access or has been read, provided to them from outside. Um, things that could be contributory, I have some of them in different colors just because I think we don't have a lot of evidence for that, but we, we should find out. Um, you know, certainly having other roles in addition to being a person with sickle cell dealing with the course of that, you may be a caregiver or parent and that it has stresses built into it, um, you know, that, that need to be considered. Uh, I mentioned family of origin and early models, just like any other um, individual, we are observing and learning so much from the family in which we grew up and how those uh, relationship models are, and relationships are negotiated. And we invariably bring those into our own, especially if we're not aware of patterns and how to shift them. Uh, thinking about societal norms and values about relationships and how they're negotiated. Thinking about societal stressors. I did mention COVID here because I think it's shone a light on relationships, period, um, and family functioning. And uh, why should we not imagine that it did the same uh, within sickle cell? But again, we need that kind of data to show us that, as well as the anecdotes from people who, who are living it with it uh, to tell us. Um, I wonder if there might be, uh, in some future study, a look at whether um, the particular gender of the partner has a role in how they are managing um, and negotiating relationship quality. There was one um, study I did find, it was an unpublished uh, dissertation, but um, just an interview style with about 12 males living in the UK and thinking about some of the isolation that they experience um, and, and the challenges that they find in relationships because of societal expectations of males and strength anticipated and you know being able to provide and some of those things that continue to follow males in particular in terms of expectations. And as you mentioned, income and socioeconomic status, just because I think there's variable evidence out there about how much that is having an effect on relationship quality, at least within sickle cell. But it may be less or more important than we would intuitively think, but we need to see that study. Uh, I wanted to just speak about all of, we've talked about all of those reasons that, um, you know, relationship are, are sensitive to a number of factors, but it, it makes sense, I think, at this point, just to think about why um, living with sickle cell disease may be just a whole different uh, landscape and ball game uh, for those in relationship. And a lot of it just has to do with the disease itself, obviously, the unpredictability of the disease course, thinking about lifespan, thinking about longevity, and, and thinking about making plans. We had a great conversation recently with our peer support group at Skagel about that and what middle and older adulthood can look like. And so how one contemplates that whole piece um, will have an impact invariably on relationships. Thinking about how the disease itself changes, right? The complications accrue. Um, the severity may be one thing earlier in life and it may change over time. So there's a lot to consider there. Just thinking about the life interrupting nature of dealing with health um, episodes. Um, some people refer to them as their crises. Uh, there are other ways that people refer to um, episodes of challenge with sickle cell disease and coping with it, but how it interrupts the plan making, participating, doing things potentially as a couple. Um, interruptions to your learning and, and by extension your earning. Um, you know, being able to have enough to live on, having education that gives you options for the way that you live and the work that you do. Thinking about difficulties in exposure growing up just from maybe frequently being hospitalized or having a challenging disease course. What does that mean for your social skills development and how you um, would find and, and connect with a partner? And how much independence have you been able to negotiate in your young and older life? 
um, just because of the nature of your disease first. So there's a lot that is wrapped up in growing up and being an adult and potential partner with sickle cell. I highlight here the reproduction piece because that is something that many are thinking about from a very early age. You know, what would it be like to be a parent and have that risk of passing on sickle cell? And people will negotiate that differently, but it is going to be a factor in relationships for folks with sickle cell where it might not be for somebody without. I mentioned as well just the way one sees oneself as a potential partner and sort of value one, you know, ascribes to oneself as a partner. You know, is it about my physical um, prowess or is it about other factors? What do I weigh and how do I find a partner who agrees that those, those priorities are important? I wanted to share here a very interesting um, article that I came across. This is a series that's part of a Pulitzer Center um, funded project. Um, the author, uh, Kay Varaber, did um, a number of articles in a series looking at um, some, just focusing on some young people in Nigeria and how they are negotiating life with sickle cell. As you can see, um, it really focuses at least at the early parts of the series on testing the impact of screening and in the newborn and adult period to letting one know about one's sickle cell status and what that means for partnership. I have just I extracted a quote I wanted to read aloud to you. And there are other really, um, I think, good direct lived experiences shared in this series that I would encourage people to read. But here, um, uh, just this is the, the voice of a young woman uh, referenced in the article. Marriage is one of the most important decisions that most people in the world make today. And having children is often the inevitable next step. But what if you found someone to marry and start a family with then realized your children had a 25% chance of illness over their entire lives. So here are, you know, just a, um, a reference to what people are weighing as they think about entering relationships and what progression of relationships can look like. Um, it, it was a definitely compelling reading and you'll see that it contributed to break up of some relationships for some of the people interviewed and others decided that they wanted to persevere and, and be together anyway that everyone negotiates that. Uh, in that Thinking now about what supports success, relationship success for folks with sickle cell. And I use success in this way, but how, how people define that for themselves is what's most important. But it seems that an ingredient that is helpful for promoting or increasing the chances of having that solid uh, relationship is disposing one's sickle cell disease status early, whether one has the trait or whether one has the form of sickle cell disease proper. Disclosure, of course, at the right time with the right person, this is something that people um, need to, you know, determine for themselves. But early conversations rather than a disclosure later on in a relationship seems associated with better outcomes and the likelihood of being able to continue together. Really focusing on what it takes to strengthen that bond, understanding all of the things I'm writing around it importantly how it quickly settles after a crisis or health-based interruption. Negotiating support. So um, studies, uh, the study that I, I um, was reading most recently just spoke about challenges in offering support. Interestingly, the partner without sickle cell sometimes finds it difficult to know when to do that. And the person with sickle cell may struggle with accepting it. And that creates a bit of a challenge. So really as a pairing, um, having figured out how you're going to do that, how do I offer it to you? When do I offer it to you? And then, hey, how can I make myself receptive so that my partner also understands that their, their help is uh, a part of my healing and support? Those are the discussions, I would say, critical discussions people need to have. Um, and then communicating expectations. Again, this, this is something that I think anyone negotiating relationships needs to do, especially in a serious one. You know, what do we think about our partnership and its cohesion? What are our expectations of each other? You know, um, built in. Um, to partnership with a person with sickle cell disease is going to be advocating for them, whether in the health um, arena or in some other sphere. But is that um, something that that partner can do, wants to do? How will they run the day-to-day -day things if they're living together? You know, who's doing some of those tasks? How are we dividing them? Are we doing it in quote traditional gender aligned ways? Or are we doing this in new ways that make sense for our pairing. And of course, thinking about finances. Important for those conversations clearly has got to be talking about uncertainty as just part of 
you know, day-to-day -day life, which may be a new thing for the partner who is not living with sickle cell disease, but something that the person with sickle cell can share in terms of how they cope with that. Being able to think about how that's going to affect their future as they move forward together. Thinking about coping ahead rather than crisis-based response. And I say crisis sort of meaning the broader term rather than sickle cell related only, but it seems that folks that have a roadmap and a plan for how they wanna negotiate difficulty will do better than those who have got that sort of crisis-driven response and then revert to previous when things have resettled, right? So problem solving and planning being so important and also appreciating how difficult that is when folks are managing so much already. Uh, importantly, even within a pairing or any kind of relationship, people need to think about care for themselves. I did mention that uh, differential impact on the partner who is offering caregiving. We need to make sure that we are um, looking after ourselves as well as the relationship as a unit. If we were, if we were to think about ways that as a community, um, those outside of the relationship could offer support, um, we can draw a lot from the chronic illness literature, right? Um, but I, I do want to focus on what the individual with sickle cell might be keeping an eye out for. And it turns out there are many wonderful blogs written by people living with sickle cell that offer their tips. And I encourage people to do a search. It's, it's good reading and it comes from folks who have uh, that very valuable lived experience. But partner selection being paramount, thinking about what one is looking for and thinking about the flexibility that that partner can offer in a relationship, which is so important. Getting used to the idea of interdependence in all meanings of the word, just given the disease course and the need for support to be practical and other support. That ability to get into positive coping strategies for relationship rather than ones that are crisis driven and may not be as well um, developed as ones that are planned as much as one can plan. Um, communication being paramount, you know, really being important to share what's going on internally for that person's sake and also for the sake of the relationship and thinking about advocacy and how to really um, agree on how that's going to be done and being willing to be that partner who steps in. So looking for someone with these traits seems important um, based on what is available right now, uh, literature and anecdote wise. What could we do as a community? Um, to support those with sickle cell disease and, and contribute to some relationship quality potential. Well, it'd be wonderful to see some more research out there that captured lived experiences, yes, but also try to boil down things like predictors of relationships with success so that we understand what the ingredients are, you know, and rather than just, you know, drawing from other examples of chronic illness, what are the ones for sickle cell? We don't have a lot of studies right now, and those would have great value. Um, just as someone who uh, works in a counseling role with folks, understanding just the value of culturally informed intervention. Sickle cell disease does travel along cultural and ethnic lines, right? Uh, and we need to think about that context when we're recommending and offering supports to people. We need them to work for their context and their reality. Uh, I'd love to see medical visits, and this is very much in line with our health um, quality standards uh, that were released earlier, thinking about psychosocial screening as also screening about how a relationship, that primary relationship is going, just because it does speak so much to, you know, what the needs are for that individual and couple, but also how we can intervene and support them differently. And when I think of supportive resources for folks with sickle cell and their partners, I think, you know, there's a lot out there. Is it highlighted sufficiently for folks? Do they know that they could go to their pastor or cleric? Do they know that there's counseling out there and that stress reduction for themselves is going to also help with their overall relationship quality. Can we look at the practical things like, you know, housing security, financial structures, and how to address those? How do we keep education flowing so that people really understand sickle cell and the latest standards of care? And how does that, that can only support advocacy, I should say. Thinking about how to really encourage um, peer relationships and networks that sustain folks in times of difficulty and good times, and thinking about ways that we improve our systems equity so that when folks are at accessing medical care and healthcare, they're doing so in a way that's tailored to their needs and supports them rather holistically. All right, with that, um, I, I want to pause. I know I've said a lot here. There may be some questions that have come in. I'm not seeing them, um, but I know that time. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's coming. Um, I know that Tanya has joined us and I, I wonder if she might want to say a few words. I believe Tanya also has some questions for me. 
Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandra, uh, for your uh, informative session. Uh, and uh, everyone, I'm sorry again for uh, the little issues that uh, we met uh, while I was trying to join the session. So for now, I don't see any question in the Q&A, but feel free, uh, like we said, we have the chat box where you can uh, submit your questions or directly through the Q&A. Um, but I may have a question uh, for you, Dr. Sandra, uh, a question that is um, quite uh, related to my own experience, but I would like to hear from someone else and maybe I can uh, myself. And this question is not only for people with sickle cell, but also with trait. So the question is, how early in a relationship should couples discuss sickle cell? Thank you, Tanya. It's a great question. I, I know in my sharing just now, I suggested that it is something that comes earlier rather than later in a relationship. But I also appreciate that there are many types of relationships a person might have. And I would, you know, certainly from what I've read from lived experience, blogs and things like that, people are thinking about relationships that would seem to be going the distance and that they would like to be longer term. However, even those that may be briefer in nature or, or you know, shorter term, um, sickle cell is going to be in the air, right? It may result in canceled plans, delayed plans, changes in just your mood and how you're feeling. Um, because it's a part of one's life, um, one hopes that you can, in sharing your life, share that. Um, I think it gives that other person information about you and how you cope and what you need. And it tells you a lot about their readiness to partner with you on any level. So I would advocate for sooner than later, also realizing a person has to use their own judgment about how much they disclose about anything personal at any point. Um, I think you said that uh, this was, there was a reason behind your question. Did you want to share anything? I'm, I'm turning it back on you in, a, I hope, a helpful way. <laughs> what do you think, Tanya? Thank you. Thank you for returning back to me. Uh, what I think, I think one of the, the important uh, elements that you mentioned, it's like in any relationship, how um, how you will feel about sharing uh, certain elements. It's uh, one of the main uh, guides, I may say, uh, and your judgment as well. But like you say, Sikasa will be around. Uh, it's not, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know if I will use the, the right word, uh, but it's not for not, not for everyone. For some people, you can have some physical element that can right away uh, trigger the conversation. But for others, there's nothing physically that can show. So you need to have the conversation. And why I was talking about trait, uh, that's where awareness is really important because people with traits may feel that it's not really important to share because they don't see the impact. But the reality is if you meet a partner that has the trait as well, you know right away that you have 25% for each of your children uh, that may have sickle cell. So do you wanna talk about this right away, make your decision about that? Like I was saying, uh, personal uh, experience, I knew I had the trait, uh, but that was not the case for my partner. So uh, when I, and I knew because my, my parents were like, you know, you cannot. <laughs> that was what was enforcing me. So when we, we first met and I'm, I'm, I'm a tiny person. So when we first met, I was like, Tada, I have a sickle cell trait. What about you? It was like, look at me, huge, like, no, no, no way. And that was just misinformation. People mm -hmm. thinking that's when you're tiny like me, that's where you can have the trait or even the sickle cell itself. Mm -hmm. But when you are huge and, and um, yeah, that may not happen. So it's not only uh, two years down the road, we were already engaged and already making plans for marriage that uh, he had another sickness and had to go with further exams. And mm. they found out that he had a trait. So mm. at that moment was, what do we decide? Do we stop things there? We are like, uh, yeah, we already uh, 
engage, engage, engage not only engage in the relationship, but also he proposed. So right. I was already wearing, wearing my rings and all of that. And you were like, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it was important. What, one of the important things was that we took the decision together. It was really together that we decided that we'll move forward, whatever will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three beautiful children today, uh, two that has the traits, and one was sickle So, okay. uh, And I think the fact that we, uh, it was a common decision when the hard time was coming with uh, um, facing uh, sickle cell itself, we could, um, you know, hold on hand to hand and move forward with that because, and I'm saying things, I don't know, like people may say, yes, it's okay, let's go. And once the reality come up, you're like, reality check. I was not ready for that. So, you know, many, many people can react uh, differently, but it's important because uh, after that moment, we went to uh, information session to understand really what it means being to mm -hmm. people with sickle cell and all that, and more and more getting educating uh, uh, around the, the sickness. So that's for people with trait, but I think with people uh, with the sickness itself, it's also important because, um, yeah, your partner, like you, you. I don't think on the first date, hello, my name is Tanya. I think it's kind of the topic, but uh, just it's important to address that. And for the people to start, uh, the other person start to understand what are some of the challenges that can come with that. So that will be my two cents. Well, that, that's, uh, that's yeah. at least $5. That's very, <laughs> Tanya, that, that's, I thank you for sharing just of your own story, because I think you're speaking to what is a more typical sequence for people, maybe going through their lives, not even knowing that this is part of their makeup, making plans, having that revealed later. And then, as you said so wisely, um, you have to determine, you know, whether the relationship you have can hold this new reality or cannot, you know? And I heard it just in your words, um, clearly people that communicate highly together, right? And have made a commitment before this news and feel that that commitment endures beyond it. And now you're willing to think about how will we approach, you know, the risk that a future um, pregnancy may be uh, one where the child has sickle cell. But I, I'm hearing there was a sense that, you know, you were going to be able to navigate that. And I would not be surprised to know that um, there is supportive family in there too. Um, even though their their involvement um, around this this whole process seemed to be about, you know, avoid, you know, <laughs> make sure you don't. Um, once you are a couple and you declare that, um, bond between you. I think it does guide how others respond. But I, I, I think that um, just thinking about the future studies, I wish that we, um, or I hope that we'll have, I think even just thinking about how a couple might um, rate their relationship strength uh, before receiving news and then how they would rate it following and at different points. Um, I'm sure that it's a, it's a negotiation at many times in the relationship um, as things occur. But I appreciate you sharing that um, with me and with us. Um, yeah, thinking about the trait, that is not something I focused on in this talk, but of course the trait being somebody with a sickle cell gene who has a risk of transmitting sickle cell disease if um, the partner also has the trait and there is a risk per birth right? Um, and same with the person with sickle cell disease who um, has a child with somebody who has the trait, that, that risk is actually increased per birth, typically, right, depending on the type of sickle cell. So um, a lot of thinking about the future and a lot of hoping that um, the bond you have is going to take you through any times to come. So thank you for that, Tanya. I, I see a question. Um, I wonder if we have time for these questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely yes, we, we do. We oh, great, great. Yeah. Great. 
We have two questions, actually. Uh, one of them was partially, I would say, responded with the conversation we just had. Okay. Uh, but let's start with the first one, and then uh, we'll move to the second. So the first one is from uh, Periana. Thank you for your question. Can it be possible that you can actually be short-sighted in your life goals because of the trauma sickle cell disease as caused in your life? Mm. Wow, I, I'm also grateful for this question. Ooh, uh, and it, my immediate thought, you know, just my own, I'll say, um, not one that I'm drawing from a study or a, a book or something like that, is just appreciating the tremendous um, challenge involved in going through your life's developmental tasks, thinking about the future you envision. And needing to make decisions that are based, you know, in even greater uncertainty than your age peers would have to, right? Nobody knows the future and how it's going to look, yet we make our plans. Growing up with um, a health, chronic health condition like sickle cell is going to have an influence necessarily on what you think the future can look like. Um, in terms of short-sighted and life goals and trauma, you know, I, I think... I think we plan our goals to the best of our abilities and based on what we're seeing today and what we hope for in the future. I think it's so important to have compassion for ourselves. Self-compassion is a whole literature, um, by the way, which just speaks about the ways that we give ourselves grace, the way that we understand that we made decisions at points in our lives based on what we knew. Um, and that maybe with more information or at a different point, we might have made a different call. So we need to be able to have that, um, I think, care and respect for where we were when we made a decision and the many things around it. And trauma is mentioned here. You know, I, I hear people certainly in our conversations, counseling wise, speak about um, the trauma that comes from medical interactions that comes from just, you know, just their pain experience, comes from some of the life interruption. When I, when I see short-sighted, I think, um, aren't folks doing the best they can when they make plans? They're doing it within just a whole, just an abundance of potential challenges and unknowns and doing the best they can to plan forward for a future, which is a courageous act, number one, and doing so based on what they have available in terms of information. I think it really calls for self-compassion and that perspective on self, which says, wow, I, I was negotiating a lot at that point. I don't know the things, didn't know then what I know today. Um, I might make a different choice today. I might not have, you know, my, my choices made sense for me at the time. And so now at this point, I have an opportunity. I can either look at those things, those choices, lament them. And sometimes we have to process that, no question. But we can't quickly move on to, you know, the future and optimism. But there is a choice involved in how long you stay um, considering what is past and how much you let those experiences, you know, affect your ability to imagine a different and more positive future. I think you need to spend time addressing some of those traumas and thinking about the decisions made then in those contexts and then to examine the here and now and the resources available and how they can contribute to positive future steps. And there's no need to do that alone either. That can be done um, through an abundance of supports, so whether it's your family and friends or someone you engage, you know, in a counseling form. But I, I hear in that question, um, hope I'm not projecting <laughs> much. I hear, I hear wanting a different path forward and perhaps hoping that decisions of the past are not going to um, get in the way of, of a different future. And I would, I would encourage thinking ahead and moving forward with support. And I, I hope that that's going to be a good outcome for you. Thanks for the question. I hope that was helpful. Um, see a second one. Maybe I should, would you like me to go ahead and read that or would you like to, Tanya? Oh, uh, you can go ahead. 
All right, so I wonder if this is both a statement and a question. So an anonymous attendee has written, mm -hmm. is it good for warriors to unite in marriage? Number one, to procreate. Number two, for companionship, no kids. Or shall we say the decision is theirs, not a societal issue? And in brackets that folks with sickle cell disease based on experience often fear bringing kids in to relive their painful experiences. And I think there's a lot of interesting uh, stuff highlighted in this comment slash question. Thank you for it. Um, what jumps out to me right away is just how much societal expectations govern much of what we do and that one of our life's tasks truly, especially as we move into adulthood and have a bit more autonomy, is to decide whether those are the rules that need to apply to us in the way that they did when we were, you know, more dependent and, and less self-actualized. You know, I, I think that um, someone's choice about marriage or not, children or not, is their own absolutely their own. I'm not saying that there are not pressures from the family, from you know, uh, examples around you, friends about what should be done, but ultimately it's your life. And so you need to make decisions that make sense for your life. Hopefully, um, you know, when in partnership with somebody, you are, are constantly negotiating, you know, what, what the must haves and what the optionals or, you know, nice to haves, not essentials are as you move forward. I think people um, make decisions that make sense for them as a couple. And I think today you're seeing more and more of that. You're seeing people decide what makes sense for them and moving forward with that. I, I cite, for example, the child-free movement. <laughs> there are people who may not have sickle cell or a chronic condition at all who've decided that children will not be part of it. Um, their relationship or their their life moving forward. Um, and the reasons, I might add, for having children really do vary. You know, there some of them are, you know, just because it's it's why we marry, you know, and for others, it's, it's actually the end point that uh, folks are most invested in. So I think the only people that can really answer this question are those within the couple. And I hope that as a society, we get better at allowing people space and room to make the decision that makes sense for them. In the case of sickle cell, I don't want to miss that part of the comment that speaks about the real fear uh, in having um, bringing children into the world who may in turn endure some of the suffering that that, that person has. And I think that is something that weighs in heavily into the decision to have children or not. Um, I think that one can't even necessarily know how to prepare for that fully before children arrive, except to really take a bit of inventory about the kinds of supports around them, the kind of medical expertise they can access and, you know, determine what, what is going to help them at those crisis points. This is where that planning forward is so important. I mean, a plan is not going to be perfect. There are going to be individual variables in every circumstance, but even just knowing how you hope to move forward during a time when you can plan, it's so much better than trying to do that when there's a crisis point. And uh, I hope that, um, I hope that folks where possible are doing as much of that planning as their lives allow. Um, it's, there are so many unknowns. It's, it's very much about an individual sense of um, um, confidence in themselves and the partner and the network around them to support um, in difficult times and in good. Uh, I wish this person the best if this is something they're contemplating. Thanks for the question. Yes, thank you. And if I may add, uh, as I was mentioning uh, previously, mm -hmm. uh, I think, and it, uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure because it's hypothetic, but I believe if I was, um, uh, if I had a sickle cell myself and faced, like I said, it just a few years down the road, I think my reaction would also have been more uh, different because. I myself leave the challenges that bring sickle cell. Do I really want to pass it to my children? That would have been uh, something that, that I think would be uh, important for me. But I think at the end of the day, like you said, it's the couple. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the couple. Or sure, for sure, there's the pressure uh, mm -hmm. of the society, of our parents, of people around. Because at the end of the day, there will be our support system. And we don't want anyone to come to say, hey, 
you knew better right. uh, when you need to face those. Uh, but it's important to have the conversation, important to find to find the resources and be ready, be prepared. I think that's as much as you can be, right? Yeah, I appreciate that. Many folks want to experience um, caregiving, you know, of their biological child. And uh, for them, that is actually in the weighing of things, super important, right? And they're relying a lot um, on that possibility that this child will not be affected or saying, if that happens, I know through my lived experience, how I can help that child. There may be that feeling as well, right? It's not unknown to me. I've walked this path. So I think a lot goes into it. Um, and I think we need to give folks room to make the best decision for them. And, and I hope that it will be an informed decision. I see that our poll has gone up um, for folks to respond to before we wrap up. I think we've got just a few minutes left. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions that have come in. Tanya, if you have other comments. Um, I do know that I want to thank everyone for uh, listening today. And if there's interest in some of those articles or things that I've mentioned, um, I'd be happy to provide those. I'm just going to go back to the slide with um, that series. Hopefully I can. Yeah. Uh, I just really think it was such a good reading. And um, many, you know, I know people from Sickle Cell Hill from all over the world, but those living in a West African context might find uh, some of the narrative here very relatable. And uh, I, I hope there's a chance to revisit that with folks here, what their responses were, maybe in the next summit, who knows? But uh, if there are no other comments, I'll, I'll just say thank you and um, let Delaney advise us about what's next and can't believe it, end of the summit almost. <clears throat> you said it. I mean, thank you to both you, Dr. Newton. Thank you, Tanya, for that great moderation. You're right. We've come to a close in terms of the actual simultaneous sessions. Um, all that's left of our summit, sad to say, are our closing remarks from our leader in chief, Mrs. Lamri Tunji Ajayi. So for those of you who haven't completed the poll, please do so. Uh, there'll be a few minutes before we start our closing remarks at 225. So if you return to the feed loop landing page, you'll be able to join the session there. But I mean, what a fantastic session to close out our summit. Thank you so much, Dr. Newton. I always feel so informed and I definitely love the chamber of your delivery. It's always so appropriate given the topic area. So much appreciated thank to you. Always in gratitude. Really happy to have you. And, and with that, folks, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. See you in the closing remarks shortly.